You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. John chapter 15, and we're going to begin at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. I have history with this verse. The history that I have with this verse, maybe some of you have history with certain verses of the Bible. Um, I was in seventh grade and I did not do good in that particular semester. And growing up in my family, if you did not do well in school, you would be punished. My dad And my mom, mostly my dad said, you don't bring anything in this house but an A or B. Now the issue is, he said basically to us, like, look, you're smart, you're capable, you're intelligent. If you get bad grades in school, it's because you're not trying. It's because you're not really applying yourself. And so this particular semester, I did not do well. I had a very, very bad grade. And so I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And there's a whole story that goes along with that. I won't go into everything. But the the particular point I want to bring out is once the report came, my mom, she was always the more reasonable one when it came to grades. And she came to me and she said, what is wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean? She said, what, why would you do what you just did? I want you to write down what happened. How did you get in the position that you were. So I went in my room, I sat down, and I thought, you know what, I need to figure out how I'm not going to get in trouble, so I need to be very, very spiritual. I thought the best way, bring in the Bible. Get theological. And so I got down, and I wrote a note, and I said, hmm, you know what passage came to mind? This passage, John 15. And I thought, hmm, you know what happened? I think that along the way, I forgot something. That apart from Jesus... I can do nothing. I forgot that. I forgot about being attached to the vine. And because I wasn't attached to the vine, I didn't do good. 
And I gave that to her. I'm thinking like, oh, this is going to really impress her. She's going to think like, ooh, he's, he's really, you know, repenting. The Lord's working in his life. My, my motives for using that verse in that way were very impure. And I used it in the wrong way. That verse is not supposed to be used as a way because uh, whatever I'm doing in life, I stay connected to Jesus. He'll help me do everything else that I need to do in life. That's not the point of the verse. I misused the verse and I got the point of the verse wrong. And this morning, I don't want us to miss the point of this verse. Every preacher, when they get into a text, they feel like this is the most important, most wonderful text. I feel like that this morning because of what I think is happening in our world. And one of the things I want to point out this morning is the, the point of this text here is that Jesus says, if you remain in me, you will bear fruit. That if you are really a disciple of Jesus, if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, you will bear fruit. And so the, the picture that Jesus paints here is a metaphor. You know, sometimes when people come to Christianity, they come to it for all kinds of reasons. They come to the Bible, they come to church, they come to Sunday school for reasons that are all personal, all selfish. They come to church because they want to be uplifted and they want to be inspired or maybe they want to scratch the itch of altruism, which is, you know, I'll have real concern for other people. But the, the, the question of, uh, I want to answer this morning is, what does it look like to really be a disciple of Jesus? What does it really look like for us to be connected to the vine? And the question that I want you to answer before we leave this morning is, are you really a disciple and are you really connected to the vine? The picture is a very um, clear picture and there are three basic uh, characters, if you will, in this uh, picture. You have the vine, you have the gardener, and then you have the branches. So if we look at each one of those things uh, one at a time, verse one, he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. In this area of the world, you would see vines all over the place, especially in our area, we see vines all the time. Grapes, I mean, we live really close to wine country, and they would see vines all the time. But when you hear vine, and when they hear vine, two totally different things come to their mind. Then we'll come to our mind. When you hear vine, you just hear, oh, something that has grapes on it. But when they heard vine, the way that they heard vine as they were growing up as Jews in Judaism is the way that God would talk about Israel. When God spoke about Israel, he called them a vine. A vine that he loved and tended and the vine was supposed to be uh, a vine that gave fruit and shade to the nations around them. But what ended up happening, and you see the, the history of Israel, is they always failed. He would always go to the vine, and they would be messed up. He would find bad fruit. This is uh, Psalm 80 and verse 8. It says, you transplanted a vine from Egypt. Remember, they were, the Jews were in Egypt. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and took and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea. It shoots as far as the river. So here's God's calling Israel the vine. This is Isaiah chapter 5. Listen to verse 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes, uh, good grapes, good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. 
The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So we see, and this is all over the Old Testament, when God looks at Israel, he sees them as a vine, but they're a vine that is wild. They're a vine that has not done what it's supposed to do. He doesn't see the things he's supposed to see in it. And so when Jesus says, I'm the true vine, he's saying there are other vines, counterfeit vines, but I'm the true vine. Israel was the way that if you wanted to know God, you would have to go to Israel and find their God. He's saying now, because Israel, they keep failing, I am now going to be the true vine. You come to to me, you find life. So when Jesus says, I'm the true vine, he is claiming to be the one, he's the one that was promised to come and show the way to God. Now, the second person we see in this text is the gardener. The gardener, it says, he comes and he prunes or he cuts back. That's the two things that he does. He either prunes the vine or he cuts it back. Now, who is the gardener? Jesus said, my father is the gardener. So Jesus is a true vine. And notice in the other I am statements, Jesus never brings the father into it. He always says, I am. And then he says, but in this time, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Now, we're going to talk more about this in a minute. The third group is the branches. Who are the branches? He says, I'm the true vine. You are the branches. Who is you? The you are the disciples. And by extension, everyone who comes to know Jesus is a branch. So these are, this is the picture we see. <clears throat> now, if you, I don't understand art. So if you look at a picture and you see a, a beautiful uh, a portrait and they say, what does this mean to you? I would say, I don't know. Because I don't understand art like that. So when we look at this picture of the vine, and Jesus uses this beautiful, he always was awesome in the way that he would take pictures to communicate spiritual truth. But in this particular passage, what then is he trying to communicate to us when he talks about the vine and the branches? What does he want us to see? Now, here's, here's something that's important. Those of you guys who like sports, in the beginning of the year, when a coach is asked by reporters, what is it that you want to accomplish in the world? What is it that you want to accomplish this year? What do coaches always say? I want to win a championship. I want to be the, the, at the top of the food chain. I want to be the best. What does a manager who hire, or owner who hires a manager want that manager to do? I want you to make me a profit. What do players who play in a game, what is it that they want to accomplish during the year? They want to produce. Here's a question. If you're a disciple, what does Jesus want from you? He wants you to produce. What happens to the coach who doesn't produce? What happens to the player who keeps throwing interceptions to the other team? What, keeps, what happens to the manager who fumbles millions and millions of dollars? They are fired, they are cut off, they are benched. And so here's what Jesus is, is trying to help us see. The essence of true discipleship, how you know you are truly a real disciple of Jesus is that you produce. If you're not producing, as we will see, You will be benched, you will be cut off, you will be fired. Now we saw this in the text when it talked about these fruitless branches. Did you notice that? We talked about branches in him that bear no fruit. What happens to them? The gardener comes along, he cuts them off, they're gathered and they're thrown into the fire. Now if you're like me, you read that and you say, that sounds scary. I don't want to be one of those. But your, your mind also starts to go and say, well, wait a minute. These are people who are in the vine, and yet somehow they were able to be cut off and thrown into the fire. So where my mind immediately went is, well, what Jesus is saying here is that there are people who can be in Christ, can be Christians, and then they can lose their salvation. In fact, that's how a lot of people will interpret this verse. This books have been written, and the place they will go to is John 15. Because they say, you can be in the vine, and then you can be cut off. 
Is that what he's saying? Now, that would conflict with what he said earlier in the book of John. Remember in John chapter 10, he said, no one will be able to snatch you out of my hand. So is he saying this? Now, a couple things. One, when you're looking at a picture in the Bible or a parable or an allegory or a story, you want to be careful not to press the details too far. Because when you do that, it starts to get ridiculous. If I say it's raining cats and dogs, you would say cats and dogs don't come from the sky. And if they came from the sky, they would fall and there'd just be blood all over the floor. Like you would say, well, the point is, it's raining hard. The point is not to be literal. And we can take pictures that Jesus gives and push it too far. Remember, Jesus here is not trying to answer the question, can somebody lose their salvation? That's not the point of his story. The point of his story is, if you are a disciple of mine, you will bear fruit. So he tells this, or he gives this picture in order to make that point. He's not using the story to make, or to try and answer that question. So it would be wrong for us to try and use this as a way of saying, this is what Jesus is saying about that particular topic. Now, having said that, I think that there is something in here that we need to take notice of, and that is that Jesus is saying something very specific about branches that are, quote, in him, but who don't bear fruit. And again, if you look too close, if you look at any picture and you zoom in, and you zoom in, you miss the beauty of the whole picture. You're just, you're just looking at pixels. So get back and see what is he saying overall about this thing. Pictures and illustrations, they can be taken too far and we miss the original point. But there are those, I think what Jesus is saying here in the text is that there are people who have, watch, a kind of connection to Jesus, but it is not a true, real connection. This is really important. You can have a kind of connection to Jesus that's not real. Amen. Now, you don't have to go too far in the story to see this at work, do you? Remember, Jesus is giving these words, uh, John chapter 13 all the way to 16. It's called the Upper Room Discourse, where Jesus is telling his disciples he's getting ready to leave. In a matter of hours, he's going to be arrested, put on trial, crucified. So he's trying to comfort his disciples. But earlier, do you remember something that happened in this story? Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he lets them know that someone was going to betray him. This is John chapter 13 and verse uh, 21. He says, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another. This is so interesting. At a loss to know which one of them he meant. They, they didn't even know could it be me? Might I betray the Lord? He says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. This is John. He, Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. I love this picture. John's just chilling right next to Jesus. And Peter's like, John, psst, John, ask him. Ask him which one it is. John's like, no, no, stop. Ask him. Ask him, ask him. I see John just go, hey, Jesus, who is it? I want to be in prayer. Tell me, who, who is it? And you know what Jesus gives him the answer? Look at this. Jesus answered. He gives him the answer. It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Now, watch what happens then. Dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. This is crazy to me. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. John, he just told you. How are you not knowing this? Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to go give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Judas heard 
Jesus say things and teach things that you will never hear. Judas saw Jesus do miracles that you and I will never see. Judas heard things that no one on the planet will ever know unless there's a replay in heaven. He knew Jesus at a level that some of, none of us will ever really truly know him. And yet, he betrayed him. They trusted him even with the money. You know, if you don't trust somebody, you don't give them the money. That's how much they trust him. We're going to give you the money. And even after he gave all that information about who it was, they still didn't know. He took and he left. And he was like, we still don't know who it could be. After all of that, it wasn't like Judas was the obvious one. Like I said, someone's going to betray him. And y'all went, of course it's Judas. Emo Judas. He's always in the corner just like, of course it's him. No. They had no idea and it was him because closeness to Jesus doesn't mean you're connected to him. Closeness to Jesus doesn't mean that you're connected to him. My daughter is sleeping through my message. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another way to say it is that someone can confess Jesus and not possess him. You can tell me all you want. I have $10,000 in my account. I have $10,000 in my account. You can claim it all you want. But do you have it? Because if I, if I, if I say, let's, let's see, show me your account now. Show me in your app. Oh, the Wi-Fi is down. I can't show you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can claim it all you want just because you're close to Jesus doesn't mean that you actually possess him so then who are these fruitless branches fruitless branches are people who have a close proximity to Jesus but they're not really connected to him I've been in the church my entire life hundreds Thousands of people come through the doors of Village Baptist Church and other churches who for years served him, worshipped, gave. Just because you're close to him doesn't mean you're connected to him. And so what happens to those who are close but they're not bearing fruit? It says that they are cut off. By whom? Don't forget the gardener is the one who cuts off branches who are not bearing fruit. Please do not put any more energy into trying to figure out who's a branch who's not bearing any fruit. Get the shears. We got to get the shears out of Christians' hands. Fruitless. Fruitless. This is how a lot of Christians walk around taking the knife that belongs to the gardener. It doesn't belong to us. God is the gardener and he will eventually, he will eventually. Here's the thing. Eventually those who are fruitless branches, they will be obvious. So we don't have to go through all the, the trying to figure out, well, let's see who's really in him. Eventually God will do that work. Now, we've seen the fruitless branch. What about the fruitful branch? The fruitful branch is the branch that is connected to Jesus. Now, fruit, how is it produced? Fruit, it's, and again, this is a very simple picture. And we all know this, but sometimes the most simple things are very, very profound. How is it that fruit is produced? Fruit is produced by being connected to the vine. Fruit is produced by being connected to the vine. Now, a couple things I want you to see about this. Number one, fruit bearing is not a test. Amen. It is a byproduct 
of being connected to the vine. See, what people hear this text is, oh, I got to bear fruit now. I got to bear fruit because I don't want to be cut off. So I got to get to fruit bearing. Fruit bearing is not a test. It's simply a byproduct. Notice something here in this text is that the command is not bear fruit. The command is remain or stay or abide or continue in. So the, 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 the imperative, the command is not bear fruit. The command is just stay connected, remain. 11 times in this text, he uses that word, remain, or abide, or stay, or continue, or cling to. All meaning the same thing, that you have to stay connected to the vine. When that happens, fruit is a byproduct. It's not you trying to pass a test. Because when you are connected to the vine, it happens organically. There's a kind of growth that happens that's only external. We don't really have it here, but when it gets cold sometimes, you ever have ice on your windshield and the ice builds up? Where'd that ice come from? It did not come from the car. The car did not produce the ice from itself. It came from the outside. Sometimes there's a kind of growth that only happens from the outside. That's not the kind of growth he's talking about when it comes to the vine. When it comes to the vine, it is an internal organic growth. It is the very life of the vine pulsating and giving life to the branch, which then can make fruit. And so here is the, the point that Jesus is making. Jesus is making the point that if you want to bear fruit, you need to be connected to the vine and in being connected to the vine, you will bear fruit. It will just be the byproduct and you won't have to stray and bear fruit. You don't have to do that. It just happens. But secondly, fruit bearing is not a payment for salvation. People tend to think, if I want to get into heaven, if I want to get into heaven, I have to bear fruit so that God will accept me. I bear all this fruit, put it in a bucket, bring it before God, say, God, here's my bucket of fruit. I hope it's enough to get me in. It is not what he is saying. Jesus says in verse 3, look at verse 3 of John 15. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This is an important point to make. Fruit bearing is not so that you can show God that I'm worthy to go to heaven. He told the disciples, you are already clean. You are already, it's the same word for prune. You are already clean. You are already pruned. Now this is interesting because in John 13, verses 10 and 11, Jesus is talking to the disciples in the upper room and he says to them, Jesus answered, thank you, son. <clears throat> Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. Now, why would he say not all of you are clean? Because Judas is there. He's not clean. He's not in the vine. Remember, he's close to, but he's not in it. But when Jesus gets to, let me, re, let me finish, and though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. So Jesus says you are already clean because you're connected to me. And this time there's no caveat. All the disciples who are there who are listening to Jesus, they are clean. So this is the good news that before you think about producing anything, you need to think about your position. You have a position in Christ. You are righteous. You are covered by his blood. All of your sins have been made white as snow. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that happens before you bear fruit. Amen. Not after. Position leads to production. It's not the other way around. Don't think, the, the gospel says you are already clean. You are already made new. You are already right with God. And so bear fruit out of that. So bearing fruit is not so that we can show that we are saved. It is the product of being saved. And so 
You are already perfect. There's no such thing as being made more perfect. That's nonsense. I'm more perfect. Listen to John 5, 24. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has. People think, oh, eternal life is in the future. No, eternal life is now. He says, whoever hears my word, believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Right now, if you are in Christ, you are already passed from death to life. It, right now, if you are already in Christ, you already have eternal life. Amen. Now, not in the future. And so you're trying to, people think all the time, I have to do more things to make God love me, to be more acceptable to God. You are already clean. You're already clean. Here's the other thing. Fruit is produced by pruning. Look at that in verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. The Father prunes. The, the process of pruning is it takes away things that are drawing the energy and the nutrients away from the branches so that they can produce fruit. We have a plum tree in our yard. And one year, the tree was not really producing plums at all, like it was in previous years. And we were just like, man, what's going on? I felt like we didn't see a lot of plums at all. And what we found out was at the bottom of our plum tree, there's, I don't even know what it's like. I think it's part of the tree, and it grows out from the bottom of it. And it has all these it's, a, it's grown very large, but it has leaves and big sticks and branches. And what we found out was that this, this plant or this whatever part of this tree, that it was actually drawing all the nutrients and all of the energy from the tree in order to make that thing grow. And so there was not enough energy to make the plums grow. And so what a, a, a very skilled gardener will do is he will cut back anything that is keeping the plant from being more fruitful. And so it's, it's trying to help. It's not trying to hurt. But here's the thing. Those things hurt. To be pruned hurts. But it produces, he says, more fruit. Which we don't like. But it produces. L listen, listen to the Bible. James 1. We read it this morning. 18 read it. James 1, verse 2, consider it pure joy. What? Consider it pure joy? Why? My brothers, this is whenever you face trials. Ah! Joy? He says, yeah. Because, this is why you should have joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You want to you wanna, you wanna persevere? You ever try, you like want to run long distances? I want to be a mile, I want to run miles, right? And you first get out there and you're like, I am going to die. <laughs> but what happens as you keep doing it, Amen. as you keep doing it, you build up endurance and you're able to persevere. This is what happens when we go through trials. It trains us and it helps us to produce perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Again, this idea of having joy, glorying in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces what? Perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The writer of Hebrews, he says, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline. Here's, here's what he 
says what we all feel. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. When I was getting spanked, it, did not, it was not pleasant at the time. But what did it yield? What was the, the, the harvest? He says, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest. What is harvest? It is fruit of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So you know what I've noticed about trials? Trials and tribulations and issues and sufferings. The thing that I've noticed about them is that they really reveal who is truly connected to the vine. I've noticed in my life that two people in the church can go through the exact same situation. Losing a loved one. Difficulty in life. And one person goes through that and says, see, God isn't good. God doesn't care. Forget all this faith stuff and they walk away. And, the, and a different person who goes through the exact same thing, they grow through it, they persevere, and fruit is born in their lives. What's the difference? The difference is one is connected to the vine and the other is not. Because the things that God brings into our life, if you are in the vine, they will hurt, they will be difficult, but they will grow more fruit in your life. If you are not connected to the vine, you will wither and die and be thrown into the fire. So trials are always a great indicator to me of whether or not somebody is in the vine. And we have to remember this. Even though it doesn't seem like it feels good in the moment, I read a poem, and in the poem she was talking about what happens when God prunes you? And she says, nothing is cut away which it would not have been lost to keep and gain to lose. So what she's saying is there are things that if God had not cut them away, that you lose them, you lose them. It's actually a gain. But there are things if God left it there, you would think it's a gain, but it's actually a loss. There are things that are sapping that are drawing all of your spiritual vigor and energy from, and they're not always bad things. If some of us would look at our time on our phones and you wonder why you don't have a desire for God's word, because you spend 13 hours on Instagram, Facebook, TV, Netflix. You've heard from our church. We, we, we totally are for us being people who are in culture, love culture, movies, we quote, all that stuff. But what I'm starting to notice in my life is that my spiritual vitality is being affected because of the amount of stuff I'm taking in. I'm getting very desensitized also to very things that God calls evil. I'm like, ah, you know, whatever. And again, this is not to say if you have a TV, throw it out, don't watch movies. We're not legalistic like that. But we are saying, I want to bear fruit. And sometimes God says, I need you, I'm going to cut certain things out of your life. Because if I cut that out, you'll truly bear more fruit, which is what he wants from our life. Also knows that fruit is for the glory of God. Verse 8, he says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Fruit bearing it's for the glory of God. It's not for our own glory. It's not so people can look at us and say, oh, look at all that fruit. Like we like to walk around shaking our <laughs> branches for people to say, look at all my fruit I have. Our, that's not for us. It's for the glory of God. For his glory. But here's the question that's probably in your mind, as it was in mine. Okay, what is the fruit? What is fruit? I think what the fruit is, and you look at the Bible and see all the things that the scriptures say about fruit. There are a lot of places, but I want to try and just stick around this particular passage. But two things. One, I think that the fruit that he's talking about being born, number one, is the fruit of the Spirit. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Notice here, it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit. 
because they are not different fruits. They are all part of the same tree. When you are talking about the fruit of the spirit, when you go to an apple tree, you see all apples. When you go to a pear tree, you see all pears. The fruit of the spirit, is in, they are interdependent on one another. If you want to say, I, 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 I'm working on patience, right? I want to be a person who has patience. It's hard for you to show kindness if you're not patient. And it's hard to show kindness if you don't love. It's hard to have joy if you don't have love. How can you have peace if you don't have joy? They're all interdependent. And so when we're talking about when God is producing fruit in your life, he is working on all these things at the same time. All these things are being produced in your life. But the reason I say it's the fruit of the Spirit is because of what Jesus says here in the text specifically about the fruit that you will bear is the fruit of love. Did you notice that in verse 9? Look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. I circled every time Jesus said remain or abide or stay 11 times in the text and he connects it to four different things. He connects it to remain in me, remain in the vine, remain in my love and remain in my word. So me and the vine are the same thing, but he also says remain in my love. And then he says to them, I want you, my joy to be in you. And that your joy may be complete. There's a fruit of the Spirit, joy. My command, verse 12, is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Earlier, John 13, he says, a new command. I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, if you are connected to the vine, what is a fruit that you produce? It's love. Love for, watch this, other disciples. We talk a lot about courage and sharing our faith and getting out there and being bold, but do you know one of the strongest witnesses to the world of the truth of Christianity is the way that we love one another? That's what Jesus said. They'll know your disciples, how? Because of your Bible knowledge? They'll know your disciples because of the way that you pray? They'll know your disciples by how many people you heal? No, they'll know your disciples because of the way you love one another. Do you love other disciples, other people in the body of Christ? This has been a problem for me because over the last few year, uh, yeah, last few years, the, the world has watched the church fumble this. Because what we've been seeing in the culture is a lot of hostility and anger and fighting and discord, and that's been mirrored in the church. And what I've seen is, and some of you are not even as plugged into this, there's certain sectors of social media where Christians are going at each other's throats. And it's almost, it's, at times it feels almost demonic. And I'm watching this and I'm just thinking, the world is watching us. And don't misunderstand me. We don't agree about everything. If you think churches, I have to agree with you. With everything. No, some of y'all think you don't put sugar on grits. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> but I still love you. Some of you vote differently. Some of you have, some of you like country music. I don't understand, but you like country music. All I'm saying is, in this moment, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm telling you what the world sees is Christians going at each other's throats, not as if they're brothers. It's not like, oh, you guys have, you can disagree with somebody and not wish a plague on their house. You, <laughs> you can disagree with people and say, you know, me and you don't see eye to eye on that. You're my brother. Let's go get some coffee. But what I've seen in the church over the last few years, over COVID, over politics, over sports, is that we attack each other 
This is fascinating to me. Jesus says if you're abiding in Jesus, it produces love for other Christians. This is something that I see, and this has always concerns me. Over the years, there are certain people who will say things like this. You know, I'm not really into the people thing. I'm not really, you know, a people person. And I'll come to church, I'll sit in the the church and then as soon as it's over I'm out of here I don't want to go to none of the events because I'm not really into the people I'm not really into being around listen when there is a coldness toward the people of God that is a problem this is not uh, this is not saying that you are best friends with everybody this is not saying that you you hang out with everybody all the time listen we all have different needs we all have different ones we're in different places in life but i can tell you i have a genuine love for deacon allen who is 90 plus we all do but he's not gonna play uh, madden with me he's not going to the court to play basketball we're gonna do that that's that's for me and my other friends but there could be a true genuine love and respect for each other. When people come into this room, do they see, do they feel, do they sense? These people love each other. This is attractive to me. I don't know if I believe all the stuff the guy is saying from the stage, but I know that this is an environment that is irresistible. Man, I pray our church would be that. And that will draw people because the world is the world is is canceling everybody. You could tweet something in 1977, you're being canceled for it today. The problem with the church often is why we don't love each other. But if we are connected to the vine, we will have love for one another. Jesus even said, if a real love is one that lays down his life for his friends. Jesus said, I'm going to show you, I have the ultimate love. I'm going to lay down my life for you. You know, in Romans 9, you know what Paul says? He, it's crazy. Paul says, for my brothers who are outside of the faith, my other Jews, I, I would take their place in hell. That's the kind of love he had for them. I will confess to you, I do not have that love. I will share the gospel with you over and over. Please believe this. Because <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> but do you have a love for your brother? And if Paul had that kind of love for people who are not saved, what kind of love should we have for those who are saved and in the faith? Here's the second fruit. The fruit of answered prayer. Did you notice that in verse 7? He said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. And then you skip down to verse 16. So whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. I, I listened to this preacher once and he, he, he kept saying this. He kept saying, God answers my prayers. He kept saying that and it bothered me. I was like, why am I so bothered by him saying, God answers my prayers? And it's not because I don't believe God answers my prayers, but I think in that moment, there was this sort of reality that I could not speak so strongly to say, I really know God answers my prayers. You know, something happens, you're like, ah, was that the answer to prayer or was that coincidence? I know Albert Einstein said that coincidence, coincidence is God's way of working um, uh, anonymously. I think God does do things sometimes. He doesn't always put his signature on it. He's just doing good things. He makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. And there are times he does things and he doesn't tell anybody he's doing it. But I, I believe that there are times in the Bible we see God moves and he says, I want you to know this was in, 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 in response to somebody's prayer. Amen. But I don't know, can you say that with a strong sense of confidence? Hey, God answers my prayer. If you're connected to the vine, you can say that. God listens to me. The God who created the universe listens to me and answers my prayers. 
The fruit that a Christian who is connected to the vine has is they see answered prayers. Do not give a child. Do not tell a child, hey, anything you want, I'll give to you. They won't ask for anything good. If I told my son, I'll give you whatever you want. He said, oh, let's go to Crumble Cookie. Let's go to Chuck E. Cheese. Let's go here. Let's go here. He wouldn't ask for no broccoli. He wouldn't ask for, I would like to go to bed early. He wouldn't want none of that. Why? Because we're immature. But what happens when you're connected to the vine? The things that are on God's heart are on your heart. That's why when he says whatever you wish, I think he literally means whatever. But it's because you're connected to the vine. The vine, it's not like you're just going to say whatever. Because, listen, we all know that there are things in our lives that we want and desire. And if we were given a blank check or a genie came out and said, I'll give you whatever you want, that a lot of us would be asking for things we probably shouldn't be asking. But when the, when the branch is connected to the vine, that person has the heart and the mind of Christ and wants to see God's will done in the world. And their prayers will be in line with God's will and it says that when we ask in accordance with his will, he hears us and he will answer. So here's a question. Are you seeing your prayers answered? And I'm not asking, are you seeing, oh, I prayed for a job and I got a job. I prayed for my money to, to, to come and, and it came. I'm asking, are you praying kingdom-based prayers, God-glorifying prayers and seeing them answered? I just want to encourage you. If you're not seeing that, there's something to look in. Say, am I really connected to the vine? So get ready to close. I just want to ask you, when we think about discipleship, because the center of this text is being a true disciple, is being connected to the vine. But I think there are two aspects that we tend to talk about in discipleship. The first is that when you are a disciple, you are a person who knows, who cares about, who learns doctrine. Things about who God is, theology, who is God, what has he done in the world? And so... We talk about this in our church, that we want you to know scripture. We want you to know theological terms. We want you to know where it comes from. That's why we talk about what is the Greek word for this and what is a theological word for this. You've seen him up here on stage writing all these theological words out. It's not for the purpose so you can be walk around and be smart. It's because we want you to know God. Theology is about the study of God, knowing him. Knowing him is above everything. So there's the the... Doctrine, knowing God, that's important when it comes to being a disciple. But there's also ethics. That once you become a Christian, remember what God is doing in your life is he trying to produce fruit. And the fruit is the fruit of character, love and joy and peace. He wants you to become a person who lives the life of Jesus. So doctrine is important. Ethics is important. But there's a point that I think we often overlook and miss. And it is missing in a lot of people's lives who are in the church. And that is this. The... Part of discipleship of having spiritual experience with God. We worship a God we cannot see. And yet in some way, we are in an intimate, personal relationship with him. And so while doctrine is important, and living a Christ-like life is important, one person said this way, Christian experience must necessarily have, and he says, mystical, spiritual, spiritual, non-quantifiable dimension. There's an aspect to Christian life where you say, I don't know how to explain to you what I am feeling, what I'm experiencing, and what I know. There is an aspect to Christianity that is deeply personal, you experience the nearness of a God who is invisible. You say, I feel his presence. That's weird. Church is the only place where somebody says, I feel the presence of an invisible God. That Jesus is as real to me as the chair I'm sitting in. What is that? There are Christians who don't have that experience. For them, church is all about coming in, sitting down, hearing a good word, leaving, and they don't have a sense of God's nearness at all. If you are in Christ, and I, wanna, I just want to encourage you, 
if I've never felt the closeness and the nearness of Christ, that my living the Christian life is not just so that I don't go to hell. It is because it is the byproduct. I'm connected to the vine and I just see God doing these things in my life. There's a dimension to the Christian life that we just cannot explain. And that's what it means to be connected to the vine. Every time you hear Jesus say, I am, you know what you should remember? I am not. The fact that Jesus is all that he is reveals that we are all what we shouldn't be. That we're not able to be what God wants us to be. Because the Christian life is a life of dependence. You're hungry? He says, I'm the bread of life. Can't see your way? Don't know where to go? In darkness? He says, I'm the light of the world. Can't find your way to eternal life? He says, I'm the gate. Are you lost? Without protection? He says, I'm the good shepherd. Do you find yourself being chased down by death and know when it grabs you, you cannot defeat it? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. When you say, we can't find the path to the Father. I don't know how to get to him, Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you say, I will wither and die. On my own, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus was cut off so that the worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you would be cut back. Jesus, in that book of Isaiah, says, he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Jesus faced the knife of God's wrath and was cut off so that you would never be cut off. And the worst that could happen to you is that you would be cut back. And cut back not to harm you, but cut back so that you would produce more fruit. Amen. So believe in him and be connected to life. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.